Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We will begin with our prayer to be followed by the national anthem. May we request everyone to put yourselves in the presence of our Lord. God Almighty, thank you for bringing us together to celebrate Cebuano culture and heritage through the sharing of our stories. We need this in this time of uncertainty, O oh God, to remind us of our identity as a people, unique, blessed, and proud. This reminder must inspire us that whatever challenges we face, whether unseen, alien, and treacherous, can always be overcome when we are united in working for the present and the future and the heritage of our children and community. We pray for our present-day heroes who are fighting against the virus and other threats that besiege us today, our own people struggling to overcome these threats, and those who have died, fallen but never forgotten. Dearest God, Heal our land. Amen. Mahilatang tulad, tawin sa pagdain, minamahal, 
Maing hapon mga Subuwanans! Welcome to Gabi Isa Kabilin 2020 Online Activities, an engaging space to appreciate and experience Cebu's culture and heritage. To formally start our webinar this afternoon, we would like to introduce one of the active members of Gabi Isa Kabilin, the head curator of the University of San Carlos Museum. Let's welcome Dr. Jose Elizar Bersales. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I, I hope I come in clear. Um, I, there's a signal problem today with TLDT, I think. And uh, But anyway, the, the, I'm not the speaker, so I'll just introduce the, the speaker today. Our speaker this afternoon is not a stranger to me. We have been together so many times in... in uh, uh, events relating to archaeology and ceramics uh, in the, both in the Philippines and, and abroad. Uh, she has been a, she is a member of the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines since 2004 and was a board member from 2009 to 2018 uh, and vice president of OCSP from 2015 to 2018. Yeah. The Oriental Ceramic Societies are spread all over the world. And in the Philippines, there's only one, that's OCSP, which is based in Manila. And she's, she was vice president from 2015 to 2018. In 1993, uh, wait, before I proceed, I've been advised that I have to deliver opening remarks. I forgot. Oh, I apologize. Uh, there's a long, Deliza, you will be shocked at my welcome remarks. It's very long, but I will just uh, shorten it. Let me welcome everyone to the to this uh, fifth, fifth in the GS fifth or fourth in the GSK series of webinars, also uh, hosted uh, by the USC Museum and uh, Museo Parian Subo Jesuit House of 1730. I personally propose the discussion on the impact of uh, this discussion uh, against the background of the impact of the quincentennial. In, uh, in Cebu and the Philippines. That is the 500th anniversary of the Magellan Humabun Lapu Lapu encounter in Cebu would not be complete without a discussion of the trading that was going on even before the Spaniards arrived uh, at the port of Subu, you know, as evidenced by the Chinese ceramics, a Chinese Thai Vietnamese ceramics that have been excavated and exhibited in museums, not just in Cebu but uh, all over. There is clear proof that the trade with foreigners was not a haphazard event, but was uh, rather guided by principled negotiations, a further proof of the maturity of inter-island and intercultural communication, uh, even uh, before the coming of the Spaniards, or despite the coming of the Spaniards. So today, we uh, invited a very important, and I mentioned her already, uh, person to deliver a talk on the topic. Uh, she, uh, and uh, let me cut this short because it's very long. <clears throat> and to proceed, <clears throat> excuse me, to proceed with the introduction, uh, the speaker finished her Bachelor of Arts in Social Sciences degree at UP Diliman. <clears throat> So she's a fellow UP Diliman graduate, majoring in anthropology at the, at, at, in, in Diliman. Her first lesson on trade ceramics came from uh, the National Museum of the Philippines during her senior year at UP. Since joining the OCSP, the speaker has traveled to different countries related to trade ceramics, especially China, Vietnam, Thailand, and Cambodia. She has also represented the OCSP, the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines, in conferences abroad as a speaker. Deliza, uh, Rida Loso, 
of our speaker, he is currently promoting the OCSP Fujianware project, of which this talk is all about, to increase awareness on the topic. Her next focus will be on Chinese trade saladons found in the Philippines, which is also a very important part of the study of ceramics in, in, in the country, as much as in Southeast Asia, island Southeast Asia. Deliza, uh, privately, this is her work actually, she's president of Pacific Sun Solutions Inc. and vice president of Pacific Office Solutions. Her responsibilities include business development, logistics, sales, marketing, and brand development, but, not, but that's not what she's going to talk about. Today, she will talk about the trading in ceramics that came from Fujian during the, the dynasty, Song Yuan and the early Ming dynasties before the coming of the Spaniards. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you my dear friend and colleague in the profession of uh, ceramics research, Deliza Ridalosa. Deliza. Hi. Thank Hi. you very much, Dr. Gonzalez, for that introduction. And I'd like to say good afternoon to everybody. Maayong hapon, as they would say in Cebu. And I would like to greet everyone that's celebrating the GSK right now in Cebu. So as Dr. Bursalis said, I'm Deliza from the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines. And uh, before I start, I'd like to thank the following, uh, especially for this event, uh, for the opportunity. I'd like to thank, of course, Dr. Bursalis from the University of San Carlos Museum in uh, Cebu City. And um, I'd also like to thank the Ramon Aboitis Foundation, especially Heidi and her team, C. Joey and C. Martel, and the co-host, C. Museo Harian and um, also the Jesuit House of 1730, all based in Cebu. And of course, uh, I have to thank my team at Pacific Sun, Teddy and Tina, for helping me get through all the technical aspects of uh, doing a talk online. And most of all, I'd like to thank uh, the OCSP and Rita Tan for uh, having this project, the Fujian Ware Project, under our president at the time, President Angela Kila and her board. And lastly, but not least, thank you to the priceless contribution of Mr. Lee Jan An and his wife, Miss Li Rong Ching, for verifying the Fujian ceramic pieces uh, that were part of our project. So let me, uh, so today, on behalf of the society, I'm presenting Fujian ware found in the Philippines from the Song to the Yuan period of the 11th to the 14th century. In some Filipino homes, you will see some old ceramic pieces and maybe wonder about their relevance. Hopefully, after this talk, when you see Fujian ware ceramics, it will give new meaning to you. And you will look at it with your newfound knowledge, no longer thinking, oh, they're just dust collectors in a candidate. But the reminder that we traded for 700 to 1,000 years ago uh, before uh, the European colonizers came. So it's, this is the journey of uh, these Fujian ceramics to the Philippines, which is the material evidence that the Filipinos were already engaged in trade. And uh, these are just, these were not just objects, but they have a story of their journey, which I hope to share with you today. So allow me to introduce the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines. Uh, it was founded by early collectors and scholars of ceramics. Our primary aim is uh, the study of Chinese and Southeast Asian tradeware found in the Philippines. We invite local and uh, foreign ceramic specialists to speak at our meetings. We organize visits to collections and to museums. We encourage local and international archaeologists to share their research. And Last but not least, we mount 
uh, exhibitions where we launch our catalogs uh, with our partners. And the society plays a very important role in doing this because we are uh, creating uh, resources in English that scholars all over the world can use and uh, can use when they study ceramics. So before I go on, I would like to recognize our past and current OCSP members from Cebu, as you are celebrating the GSK. So based on OCSP 1982 and 1983 records from our membership head, Mary Gerlicky, um, some, of some of the members that we have from OCSP Cebu um, were Eduardo J. Avoitis and Francesca Avoitis. Uh, Leonor Echavaria and uh, Dr. Lydia Asnar Alfonso from Southwest University. Um, and then and, uh, Andoni Aboitis, Angela Paulin, and currently we have Dr. Alfonso's daughter, uh, Alma Garcia, who's also based in Cebu. We also have the Rosita. We also have Rosita Arsenas and her family who are members, and we have Susie Borromeo Milton. So these are our members based in Cebu. So we're, we don't just have members in Manila, but we also have members in Cebu. The Philippines is a significant repository of Chinese tradeware, spanning from the 9th to the 17th centuries. Moving into our fourth decade, spanning um, from 1980 to now, um, the society has had uh, rigorous research, and we've published many. We've published about uh, five catalogs on different Chinese and Southeast Asian tradeware. These five exhibitions, with their corresponding catalog, have been used as important references by many scholars and non-scholars. So we're very proud of uh, these publications and exhibitions that we have done. We have also done um, other publications that we have participated in, such as that done by the Ayala Museum on Earthenware. And we also participated in A Thousand Years of Stoneware Jars, uh, wherein many of the beautiful stoneware jars in this book are, can actually be found in Cebu. So presenting to you um, the Society's sixth exhibition and latest catalog, The Fujian Ware Found in the Philippines, which we released in September of 2017, which would be our three years ago from this month. So it's like our anniversary this month. So it's uh, coincidental. So how did we go about coming to have this project? Well. Um, it was something that uh, Rita Tan had been studying for a while. And um, so she was, she wanted to do this project and the society also wanted to have a new project because we hadn't had a, a, a project like seven years before this one. So we thought that uh, based on uh, uh, Rita doing already some groundwork on this, that we should finish the, the research. So <clears throat> the most important part of the research, uh, wait, the most important part of uh, this were the resource experts. Uh, without the resource experts, I don't think we would have been able to finish the project. So we had consultations uh, with Rita Tan on and the, her numerous reference books that uh, she got while she was studying uh, these and the kiln sites in China. And also we had the valuable guidance of Mr. Lee Jun An and his wife. And we also had extensive handling of the fines. So uh, for our project, we handled about 1,001 pieces of Fujian ware for this project. So the vision and initial research was done through Rita Tan. And so she is the one who led us to complete the exhibition and the catalog. So um, this is Mr. Li, Li Jan An and Li Rong Ching. So they traveled to Manila a few times to help us 
um, do the research, look through the collections, identify the pieces. And uh, Mr. Lee Janan is the foremost uh, archaeologist on Fujian ceramics. So with his experience and, um, and the, the excavations that he's gone to, uh, he was a very big help in identifying the provenance of these pieces. And of course, fortunately for us, Loy Arsenas from Cebu was our ex exhibition designer. Loy was a Broadway production designer and currently an award-winning cinematographer. He directed the time period movie, Larua One. And later you'll see the exhibition that he designed for us. So we decided to widen our net to open our doors to see what is outside of the society. So we did not just use pieces from our members, but we used pieces from other collections outside Manila. So we traveled to Cebu, we traveled to Iloilo, we went to different museums. So ultimately we had uh, 20, 20 private collections uh, that participated and four museums. One being that of the Rosinas, uh, 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 sorry, Rosita R. Arsenas collection in, at the USC. And then, of course, uh, uh, the National Museum of the Philippines and Ayala Museum and the Bahai Chinua Museum. So led by our president at the time, Mrs. Angela Kila and her team, we were kept very busy during this project, working late hours with our editors and with our contributing writers. It really took a village to finish this project. So we visited many collections as we could to examine and identify the Fujian pieces. So here you can see Mrs. Tan and uh, Mr. Lee Jan An examining some pieces. And then here you can see me in Iloilo at, the, at one of the heritage houses, uh, comparing the pieces and seeing what's there. We also visited local museums and we also tried to visit international museums so that we can compare uh, the pieces that we found in the Philippines versus uh, that from the kiln site. Although we already have Mr. Lee, um, it was still uh, very enlightening to see it ourselves. No? So this is the uh, Southern Fujian Kiln Museum, uh, particularly the Sizao Kiln Museum. And you can see that uh, they're showing uh, the pieces or the wasters uh, that they found. So you have to understand that uh, they don't have any perfect pieces because all the perfect pieces uh, went to the trade countries like the Philippines, Indonesia, Taiwan, and wherever else. And so what they had left were the rejects. So that's why when you go to their museum, what you'll see are, uh, are the rejects. So you feel very fortunate when you compare what we have in the Philippines compared to what they have in their museum. It's really a, a far cry. So when, when archeologists and scholars uh, from abroad come to the Philippines, they're really amazed by the quality of the pieces that we have here in the Philippines. And we should be proud that these pieces are part of our heritage and uh, it's uh, material evidence that you know, we traded with our neighbors before the uh, European colonials came. So here are other samples of what we saw in the museums in China versus the specimens that we have in the Philippines. So you can see uh, it's really quite uh, uh, nice to see the comparison and you're like, wow, what we have in the Philippines is so nice. Okay, so next we also studied reference books. So uh, these reference books came from Rita. She sat us down and there was a group of, she has a team and we're part of her team and she sat us down and uh, she gave us books. Uh, we, were, we were to memorize the pieces or the, the, the pieces that she identified in the books 
So we were to study them, and then we were to go out and try and match the pieces that she identified for us in the books. So as you can see, these were the pieces that were excavated. And then we would go out and we would find uh, the corresponding piece, whether it's in the museum or in collections. So what you see on the left is, uh, is a picture of the piece from the kiln that was excavated that we got from the book. And the, the specimen to uh, your right are the specimens that we found in uh, the collections here in the Philippines. So after we've identified which pieces we want to use for the exhibition and catalog, um, we had to do a lot of work of taking pictures of these pieces, measuring, tagging them, and uh, well, you can see that was 1,001 pieces that we had to do. And uh, we even had to clean these pieces with a swab and distilled water. So this really was uh, a lot of work. But after doing all that hard work, finally, we got to present our findings. Uh, by launching our catalog and having an exhibit at the Ayala Museum in Makati. And this is the beautiful exhibition design by Loy Arsenos of Cebu. So he did, he did a beautiful job. And later you'll see uh, different parts of that exhibit as we go through the different regions of the Fujian ceramics. So now I'm going to introduce to you what these Fujian ceramics look like and what regions in Fujian province they come from. So just before we go, we'll do a quick run through. So Northern Song was from the 10th to the 12th century, but really the production of ceramics was during the 11th century, so 11th to 12th. That's why our book is 11th to 14th century. Southern Song is from the 12th to 13th. That's what we refer to. And for the Yuan, we refer from the 13th to the, the late 13th to the early 14th century. Okay. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this is a partial map from the 11th to the 14th century. So besides Fujian province, there were other provinces that were producing ceramics at the same time. Some had better expertise, such as the province of Zhejiang, Zhejiang is very well known for making the best celadons at their Longchuan uh, kiln. Jiangxi had also exceptional kaolin uh, for their kiln site in Jingdezhen. Jingdezhen is very well known for their beautiful blue and white ceramics and also their whiteware. And also Guangdong had many exports as well to the Philippines. So all these provinces were um, also making uh, food, uh we're also making trade ceramics at the same time besides uh food the fujian province so in our catalog you can find this map and uh, what you'll see is that during the song to the yuan period there were uh, four trading routes and these trading routes uh, started with uh, one the northeast so the northeast trading route was from Mingzhou. So Mingzhou uh, is uh, not from Fujian, but Mingzhou is in Zhejiang, uh, I think. <gasps> yeah, it's in Zhejiang. So um, this trade, uh, this uh, route would go to from Zhejiang to Japan and to Korea, and uh, the southeast trading route is what. The, is the trading route that came to the Philippines and Taiwan and Indonesia. So there was also the Southwest trading route, um, which went to the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf. So as you can see, the Philippines is close to the port of Chancho, and Chancho is where we had the Southeast trading route begin. Um, during the Song uh, period, uh, the officials or the, yeah, yeah, the officials from the Song dynasty 
Uh, they wanted to break um, the monopoly that uh, the Arab merchants had within the area. So the Song Dynasty established the port of Changchou, and that's when they started having a, a lot of increased activity of trade during the Northern and Southern Song Dynasty. And uh, also, um, when the Yuan Dynasty came in and they, they uh, had the Song Dynasty, when they moved the Song Dynasty out of the picture, um, the Yuan Dynasty took advantage of the very busy port of Changchou and increased the trade activities. So that's why you'll see a lot of Yuan pieces uh, in the Philippines because uh, the Yuan Dynasty took advantage of that port in Changchou. And by the time the 14th century uh, came along, um, many of the trade ceramics had already reached to the different parts of the Philippines. So what kind of forms did we receive from the Fujian province? So we received dishes, bowls, lures, candies, vases, jars and jarlets, and covered boxes, which we also call powdered boxes. So the difference between a ewer and a candy is a ewer has a spout. It's a pouring vessel that has a spout and has a handle, while a candy is a pouring vessel that just has just has a spout. So it does not have a um, handle. So these Fujian ware um, that came from Fujian province, which is a coastal province, um, we've, we've grouped the different kilns according to um, the geographical location. So we have the northern Fujian ceramics, and we have the central Fujian ceramics, and then we have the eastern Fujian ceramics, and we have the southern Fujian ceramics. So based on our 1,001 pieces, that we were studying, most of those pieces came from Southern Fujian, about 42%. Next, about 34% of the pieces we studied came from Central Fujian. And there were fewer items that came from Eastern Fujian, and the least items came from Northern Fujian, maybe because it's uh, farther away from, from uh, for travel or so maybe that's why we didn't get so many. So let's start with the area where we have the most uh, Fujian ceramics that come from, that come into the Philippines. So a lot of pieces come from Southern Fujian. So I'll be introducing to you um, Southern Fujian ceramics. So they're very diverse pieces. It's the highest number of pieces found during our project, as I mentioned earlier. And probably because they have so many kilns and that they have large kilns that could produce uh, thousands during one fire. So this is the piece earlier that you saw. So this is a green glazed ewer. And um, you find a lot of these in the Philippines, but most of the time you don't find it with the cap. We actually had three candidates of these, but of course we chose the one with the, with the cap. And uh, it has a chrysanthemum lid and a petal design on the shoulder. So this is from the 13th century. So just a reminder that 42% of our pieces came from Southern Fujian. So here is a, a picture from our exhibition where you can see uh, the diverseness of southern Fujian ware. We have lead, uh, green lead glazed ware, ochre lead glazed ware, um, green ware, brown ware, white ware. Oh, it's just so diverse. Just so many pieces. And then this piece you commonly also find in the Philippines. I uh, usually refer to as a uh, oops, sorry. Uh, usually referred to as uh, pieces coming from Yunnan. Okay. 
I skip something? Wait, let me do that. Okay. All right, so this piece, so this is a sample of greenware and uh, greenware from Southern Fujian. And uh, this was mimicking an earlier design from a few centuries ago, actually. Um, we had similar celadons that were made during the Tang Dynasty. So that's around the 9th to 10th century. And a few centuries later, um, Fujian, uh, Southern Fujian makes uh, uh, a replica of it in their own way. But the shape is almost the same. Uh, it's just that the glaze doesn't go all the way to the bottom. And of course, the, the, the original that was designed from Zhejiang is actually a lot nicer. So we also have greenware with iron spots from the Yuan period. So this is also imitating a design from the Tang Dynasty from centuries earlier. So you will also, when you see this here in the Philippines, then you know, okay, this, uh, this is uh, probably from the Fujian. And uh, then you know, okay? So it's from the Yuan uh, period. Next we have brownware. So this is a, a brownware ewer, squat ewer. It's from the Southern Song. Should be there. And uh, this is an ochre lead glazed candy from the Yuan, Yuan Dynasty. Actually, you commonly see uh, this kind of candy in the Philippines, and you see them in different colors. So here we have it in ochre. And uh, we also have it looking like this in green. And then we also have uh, this green glazed candy with the molded dragon chasing uh, the pearl. And this is also from the Yuan Dynasty. And it, uh, on the bottom, it has a, a ribbed bottom. This piece is a green lead glazed candy from the Yuan period. And this is one of the pieces that we found when we traveled to Iloilo. So from Iloilo, it traveled to Manila for the for picturing and for being pictured in the catalog and was also exhibited at the Ayala Museum. So we are happy to find uh, these kinds of pieces in other places. So this is a beautiful tall, a tall jar uh, with a dragon. This is also one of the common jars that you will find around the Philippines from Southern Fujian. Uh, this one is a particularly nice one. Um, it has a dragon on it. And uh, this is also from Southern Fuji. So these three small molded dragon jarlets are also commonly found in the Philippines. So this is also from the Yuan period. And this is also from the Yuan period. These are also ochre green and dark green lead glazed uh, ewers. And here you have another ochre lead glaze with a wide mouth. So, And this is also from the Yuan period. It's an incised carved vase. Uh, this one is found in the Roberto Villanueva collection at the Yala Museum. Uh, this pear shape is called Yuhuchun. So the Yuhuchun vase, uh, this Yuhuchun vase was found in the province of Rizal in the Philippines. And back in the 1960s, uh, some Filipino ceramic scholars actually thought this was from Hebei province, which is in northern China. But uh, now we know that it's not, and it's from uh, southern Fujian, from Fujian province in the southern part. And a lot of these were actually found in the Philippines. This is another Yuhuchun. Oops. This is another Yuhuchun. Uh, which is from the Arturo de Santos collection. He had a very nice collection and it was documented by the Central Bank of the Philippines. This piece was found in Puerto Valera. And this is a wide mouth jar um, that is from the National Museum of the Philippines. And it's also from the Yuan period. So um, just going back to the one from, from um, the Ayala Museum, these are very deep cuts, and we refer to that kind of design as scrafito. 
So documented by Cecilia Loxin, who is a very prominent ceramic scholar in the Philippines. Uh, she documented in the 60s and 70s um, from different collections, similar pieces that were found. And uh, these pieces that I'm showing you that she documented from different collections are from Batangas, particularly Verde Island and Mubang. So on one of my trips to China, I was very fortunate to visit one of the dragon kiln sites. And uh, this, dragon sil uh, this dragon kiln site was huge. It was really easy to walk down, but I really had a hard time walking back up. I, I don't know how long it is, but it's too long. And I think uh, this particular kiln uh, was able to fire up maybe at least 10,000 uh, ceramics. So uh, I can just imagine why so many pieces came from southern Fujian, especially if uh, they had such a huge kiln like this one. So this is.
Okay. All right. So it looks like I was ahead and then the broadcast was a little behind. So I'm going to go back and start at the um, Southern Fujian, the introduction of Southern Fujian ceramics to you. Okay. So these Fujian ware came from Fujian province, of course, which is a coastal province in the south of China. So what we've done is we've grouped uh, the different kiln sites into four geographical locations. Uh, that is the northern Fujian ceramics, the central Fujian ceramics, the eastern Fujian ceramics, and the southern Fujian ceramics. And uh, based on what we collected and put together for this project, we were able to collect about 1,001 specimens for us to study. And based on uh, the statistics, 42% of our specimens came from Southern Fujian. And the next um, area which had the most pieces were the pieces that came from Central Fujian, which is about 34%. And next was Eastern, and the least amount of pieces uh, came from uh, Northern Fujian, which is which was at 11%. So this may not be exact of uh, how 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 uh, many pieces were in the Philippines, but it's like uh, having a random sample. But I really believe uh, that there, we have more Southern Fujian pieces found in the Philippines amongst all the different uh, kilns. So now I'm going to introduce you to Southern Fujian ceramics. So Southern Fujian ceramics are very diverse. And uh, I think and we feel that they have the highest number of pieces um, that you'll find in the Philippines because they had a number of kilns. And some of their kilns were quite Big, such they had some dragon kilns that could fire thousands, if not ten thousand, pieces uh, in fire in a fire. So this is a green glaze ewer. Um, in case you were wondering what that what the earlier picture was, so this is that, and this is a mold. It has a molded design um, with a with a chrysanthemum lid, and it has petals on the shoulder. And we find a lot of these um, ewers or squat ewers in, in the Philippines, uh, but most of the time you won't find it with a lid. And so we were very happy to find this uh, 13th century piece uh, with a lid. Okay. So the pieces that I'll be showing you are from particularly from the Sizao Kiln in Southern Fujian. I think what's more important is you just remember which is Southern Fujian, which is Central Fujian, so it's easier for you. So as you can see, uh, this is a picture from our exhibit. Uh, in the Southern Fujian, we have a lot of different variety. So we have lead glazed, uh, green lead glazed ware, ochre lead glazed ware, brown lead glazed ware, we had um, white ware, we had brown ware, we had green ware. So this is another piece that you will commonly find in the Philippines. We refer to them as coming from Minnan. And uh, that piece that I was just showing you was from the southern, uh, uh, from southern Fujian. So the next piece is a sample of greenware from southern Fujian. And this ewer from the southern Song dynasty uh, is mimicking an earlier design from the Tang dynasty, which is a few centuries earlier. So the Tang dynasty was from the 9th to 10th century. And uh, these pieces from the Tang dynasty were uh, particularly made in Zhejiang. 
So uh, later on, during the Southern Song Dynasty, they, they mimicked uh, this design. And so they also did their own uh, version of this uh, greenware. So the shape is almost the same, but the glaze is not as nice as that from the Tang Dynasty. As you can see, uh, the glaze doesn't go all the way to the bottom. So we also have greenware with iron spots from the Yuan period. So this is also imitating a design from the Tang Dynasty, uh, which was a few centuries earlier. So I wanted you to also see to your left are pieces from an excavation and pieces to the right were pieces that we found in the, in the collection. So <clears throat> we also have brown brownware uh, from Southern Fujian. So here is a brownware squat lure from the Southern Song Dynasty. And also from the Southern Song Dynasty a bowl with incised designs. Um, you also find many uh, pieces like this in the Philippines. And uh, we have a lot of candies. And again, a candy is a pouring vessel that doesn't have any handle. So it just has the spout and the neck. And um, this particular candy is, is uh, well, it's from the Yuan Dynasty. So this comes in different colors. So we have ochre lead glaze. We also have this in uh, green lead glaze. We also have it with a uh, molded design. So in this case, this green glaze candy had a molded has a molded dragon with the pearl with the, the dragon chasing the pearl. And this is also from the Yuan Dynasty. And as you can see, it also has additional design on the bottom. It has uh, a ribbed bottom compared to the earlier candy. And this is a is a this is also a candy. This is a green lead glaze candy from the Yuan period. This particular piece is from Iloilo, and it was found in the Visayas. So we were very happy to have this in our catalog and exhibit this at the Ayala Museum, as it was it was in very good condition, and it it was very big in size. We also have here the beautiful jar from Southern Fujian. Um, maybe you'll see uh, some homes having these uh, big jars. They call them the crying jars because you have the iron uh, splattering down or dripping down from the jars. So these jarlets are, um, they have dragons on it. So they're lead glazed, and you can find a lot of these starlets also in the Philippines. And so when you see them, you know they're Fujian. We also have an ochre, uh, green, and dark green. Uh, these are very small ewers. Maybe they were used as a water dropper, or maybe they're, they were used as toys. So you can, and I think in Santa Ana, the excavation in Santa Ana by Cecil, Cecilia Lovsin, uh, she found a few of these. We also have an ochre lead glazed wide mouth jar from the New York Theater. So this piece is from the Ayala Museum from the Roberto Villanueva collection. It's from the Yuan period. It has an incised carved uh, cut design and that design is referred to as strapito. And uh, this shape, which is a pear shape, is referred to as yuhuchun. So this is a yuhuchun vase. Back, back in the 60s, uh, they believed that yuhuchun vases, this particular uh, style of yuhuchun vases, base was from northern China in the Hebei area. But now we know that this is from southern Fujian, from the uh, Sizao kilns. So, this particular one was found in the Philippines in Rizal province. And this Yuhuchun was from the collection of Arturo de Santos, uh, which was documented by the Central Bank. This was found in Puerto Galera. And this wide mouth jar is from the National Museum of the Philippines, which is also from the New York.
It's a very big job. <clears throat> so documented by Cecilia Luxin was some uh, similar pieces. Um, we haven't seen these pieces, but we're really glad that she documented it. Um, these were from different uh, collections. And she documented that these pieces came from Batangas. So on one of my trips to China, I was fortunate to visit one of the dragon kilns in southern in the south in uh, southern Fujian. So it is a this particular dragon kiln is humongous. It was easy for me to walk down, but it was very difficult for me to go back up. Um, this dragon kiln is sloping at 14 degrees. And uh, in this particular complex, they had four kilns. And I believe that they were able to fire up uh, at least about 10,000 pieces. So it's not a wonder to me that Southern Fujian had so many pieces of ceramics that were exported with such big kilns. So in this kiln, uh, um, you had like uh, everyday ceramics that were used for utensils. And they ha also had, they also created different designs here depending on the, the demand and palette of the overseas market. So this dragon kiln used to be made of brick. So there used to be brick covering it, but it's no longer there. And so, um, the, so this is what it would look like inside. I don't know if you can see the picture clearly. And in this diorama, you can see that when they finished with the product, um, that this is a diorama of that same kiln site that uh, I visited, uh, that it's very near um, a waterway. And from that waterway, um, it would go to Chancho, the port of Chancho. And of course, as I said earlier, from the port of Chancho, that would be the Southeast trading routes, such as the Philippines, Taiwan, and Indonesia. Now, um, one of the things I forgot to mention, I think, about Chan Shou was that they were also very good ship makers. So that was one of the advantages that the port of Chan Chuan Shou's had was that they had ship makers there. So here I'm going to give you a wider view of this diorama. So here's a wider view where you can see the workshops and the four kilns that I was uh, mentioning earlier. And you can see one of the kilns is very long. That's the one I went to where I could hardly barely walk back to the top. And I just wanted to give you an idea um, what these production sites actually look like. So now I will introduce to you um, ceramics from Central Fujian. So Central Fujian, um, they had uh, a lot of whiteware ceramics and, and one of their most famous kilns are the Dehua kilns. And uh, most of the pieces that we found that came from Central Fujian that were in the pieces that we collected were from Dehua. Second, they were from the Minchun kilns and from the Zhangla. Anyways, you just need to remember Central Fujian ceramics. So it's easy. And uh, what you will find uh, in these uh, whiteware ceramics is that they have what we call a Qing Pai Kuei's, if you're not familiar with it. So this is a zoom, a close up of a Qing Pai Kuei's on this picture. So you see the swirls and you see the tinge of blue. So that tinge of blue we call Qing Pai. So this is the actual piece. So this is a vase from Central Fujian from the Minchun kilns. Uh, it has a height of about 30 centimeters or so. And it has, a, it has an incised floral uh, design. And this is from the Southern Song Dynasty. But I should really start from the Dehua kilns because the Dehua kilns is 
the, is one of the most important kilns from central Fujian. As uh, many scholars have been studying Dehua for a long time, and they have a lot of beautiful classical pieces uh, that come from here. So as you can see, the monochromes coming from central Fujian. So we had a lot of pieces in our exhibition. Uh, we also had uh, some brownware and grayware. So these two pieces are very classic. Um, so they're from the Northern Song period. And one, uh, one of the yours uh, has a Qing Pai grace and the other one has a white grace in the picture. So these, both of these ewers have a ribbed um, design on the body. And it's a very classic song beauty. And because of that, um, Rita decided that this piece uh, should be on the cover of our book. So when you look at their book, you'll see the, the Dehua piece from the Northern Song period. Other pieces that you'll find, um, there's this lovely bowl that's decorated with a molded phoenix. Um, the phoenix is in flight. And uh, in our research, we've, we saw pieces that have a chink pine glaze, and we've seen pieces that have a white glaze. So that's also from the airport kilt. We also have uh, two yuan bowls with similar narrow lotus petals. And um, as you can see, the, the bowl on the top has a white glaze, and the bowl on the bottom, uh, the lower bowl, has a chink white glaze. Uh, don't mind the crap on this. Uh, it's still a very, very beautiful piece, the, the shape. And uh, the glaze on it is something uh, very impressive. So this ewer, this ewer was um, decorated with, uh, with the thread design. And uh, we call the, the ribbings on this particular one the sugar cane, the sugar cane sections on the lower part of the body. And of course, as you can see, it has a chin pine glaze. So um, I don't know if you can see, but this, this, um, this particular piece was looted together, meaning that it was uh, two pieces and then it was put together. So I put some arrows there, so, oops. I put some arrows there so that you can see the pooling of the Qing Pai grace. Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Oh, anyways, I hope you saw the, the Qing Pai grace. Um, okay. So this is also from the Yuan Dynasty. So it's also um, has the sugar cane sections around the body. And this also has the Qin fine glaze. So it's uh, from the Yuan Dynasty, also from the Dehua Kyung. And this is another beautiful piece from uh, the Dehua Kyung. It's a squat ewer with a beautiful lotus uh, flower in full bloom. Um, it also has um, also has uh, some Ching Pai um, pulling around the rim. So let me see if I have my arrows there to show you. Oops. Okay. So you, you can see there's the Ching Pai pulling around uh, the rim. So next, of course, we have to mention candies. We have a lot of nice candies that come from the Dehua kilns are also very popular uh, for producing uh, uh, these, uh, these candies. Some are from the Song Dynasty, some are from the Yuan Dynasty, some are from, have white glaze, while others have a Qing Pai glaze. So this piece we find in the Philippines, but mostly without the cover. Maybe the cover got lost uh, sometime during the centuries. Um, there have been shipwrecks that have uh, had these pieces, and some of the shipwrecks uh, are with the cap. 
So we were happy to find this piece to add to our catalog, uh, which has the cap. So this is from the Southern Song Dynasty. So, and it uses, a, it's just a white place. These are two very, very interesting pieces from the Deaf Walk Kiln. When Marco Polo traveled um, from uh, China to Europe, he brought with him a piece similar to what you see on your screen. And uh, the one, some of the pieces that you see in museums uh, don't have the lobe, the lobe ears, but this one does. So um, I'm very happy that we have a, a, a sample in the Philippines uh, similar to what Marco Polo brought. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, you can find these in the museum in Venice. So we also exhibited this at the Ayala Museum. And it's in our book. Uh, similar pieces have also been found in some shipwrecks uh, with slightly different uh, characteristics. So now we're going into the covered boxes. Uh, maybe you see these uh, monochrome uh, boxes. Um, they could be from Dehua. Uh, don't make a mistake, just because it's white doesn't mean it's from Dehua. Uh, Dehua has a very white clay. So if your uh, powder boxes are not white, and if the clay is not white, it might not be from Dehua. So this is a Dehua covered box um, from the um, Yuan period. It has a uh, threaded design on it. That threaded design is actually a phoenix design at the center of it. And uh, it's a little bit odd because it's white glaze and then there's one portion where there's Qing Pai glaze. So we think that maybe someone made a mistake and accidentally spilled some Qing Pai glaze. So maybe you can see it in this picture. And uh, last but not least, again, among the Dehua powdered boxes is this beautiful Yuan powdered box or covered box with a chrysanthemum design. And it has a white glaze. So on, this, on the sides, you can see a beautiful threading. And it's just, uh, it's just as beautiful in person as it is in the picture. So now that we're finished with Dehua, we go to the second uh, kiln where we find the most uh, central uh, central Fujian kiln is uh, Minqing. Uh, we weren't really familiar with Minqing before, but now because of this project, we're very familiar with Minqing. And apparently, we have many pieces uh, found in the Philippines from Minqing. So this particular piece is from the Southern Song period. And uh, it has those fat lotus flowers, fat, fat lotus leaves, uh, as you can see. And it has a ching pai glaze. This is also from Minqing from the Southern Song. It's a shallow bowl with inside scroll design on it. So. And um, this is a very elegant piece. It's, an, it's a ewer. Um, that's a lotus petal that's closing, and it's uh, adeptly carved uh, from the base going to the mouth. Uh, it's in Qing Bai place, which is also a very nice piece that we have in the Philippines. This piece is from the National Museum of the Philippines. It's also Min Qing or Central Fujian, and it's from the Southern Song Dynasty. This ewer has a cover and has a swirl design on it. It was discovered in a shipwreck found in Palawan. So it was on the southwest coast of Palawan where, where they found this beautiful piece. So now I'm going to move to another kiln, which is called Jangla. So Jangla, I will, again, I was able to go to the kiln site. It's not, the kiln sites are not as 
as uh, enormous as the ones in southern Fujian. But the pieces that came from this kiln site in Zhongla or in central Fujian um, are very nice. They're very refined. Um, uh, some are thinly potted. Uh, they have a very nice glaze. And I'm really proud that we have beautiful representations of uh, Zhongla pieces here in the Philippines compared to the ones that I saw uh, in their county museum. So it was said that um, this uh, Zhongla kiln was probably um, was probably uh, open due to an uh, imperial request, which is probably why maybe they had better craftsmanship and maybe that's why they had nicer pieces. Uh, but then again, you have to remember there weren't that many pieces that came from there. So maybe it was for a higher end market. So when you walk around, you see a lot of Qing Pai glazed pieces. Um, they could be on the floor, and these are the rejects. Um, so this is a really beautiful piece. It's a very delicate bowl decorated with a beautiful molded design on the interior. It has a Qing Pai glaze. This is a piece that we found in one of the collections here in the Philippines. And uh, the shape, as you can see in the picture to your right on the bottom, it looks like, um, it kind of looks like a cap or a hat. And we call this shape Dolly One. So this Dolly One um, piece uh, is very beautiful compared to the pieces I saw at the County Museum. So this is a sample of what they have in the County Museum compared to the beautiful pieces that we have here in the Philippines. So I think uh, early Filipinos pre-colonial must have had very good taste because we, can, we have evidence of that. So this is from Northern Song, Northern Song Dynasty. It's a brown glazed dish with a scalloped rim. And this is also from the same kiln site uh, where they also produce the Qing Pai pieces. And um, I was really happy uh, to find uh, shards of this piece when I was walking around. And so we already knew from Mr. Li Jian An that this was from central Fujian, but it was a delight to actually see it with my own eyes and, and walk into it literally um, to find out that this piece uh, was really from the Zhongla uh, kiln site. Uh, this is also from the late Northern Song period, uh, from the same kiln site. It's um, a ewer with a slanting shoulder, and it has a very sharp, um, that is a very sharp angular um, shoulder. So the mouth has a trumpet, so I mean, it's also uh, interesting uh, shape, which also comes from the jungle kiln. And lastly, from central Fujian is um, this ewer, and uh, it doesn't have any glaze left on it, but you can find evidence of glaze on the joints, the joints of the spout and the joints of the handle. You can see the green. And so based on archaeological uh, the documentation, uh, you can see to the right that it actually was uh, had green glaze on it before. So now we move to the Eastern Fujian ceramics. So this is the piece that uh, you're seeing. It was it's a ewer with a fluted body and it has a chin pie glaze. It's a uh, sun and song. So we only had about 13% uh, of our 1,001 pieces that came from uh, Eastern Fujian. So this is what our exhibit looked like for the Eastern Fujian portion. So they look similar to what is found in other kilns. Again, don't get confused uh, based on the shape. And the if the color of the clay and, um, and other identifying factors is what will 
differentiate differentiate it from being Eastern Fujian or Central Fujian. So these pieces, these jarlets, are from the Yuan Dynasty, and um, I have an interesting uh, story. Is that there was a shipwreck that was found um, in Palawan and near to Bataha, and uh, which is on the east coast of Palawan, and there was a Chinese junk, and in that Chinese junk they had uh, blue and white Yuan pieces. Uh, from another province called uh, Jiangxi, or from Jingdijin. So it was nice to see that these pieces, similar to these pieces, were also found. So don't get confused. The blue and white that you see there are not from Fujian. And to see that these pieces from these blue and white pieces from the Yuan Dynasty and our little jarlet from Eastern Fujian was uh, was. That they were together. So these are named bigger bulls, and they're from the Yuan Dynasty. So you can see they also came in Qing Pai glaze and a regular grayish white uh, glaze from Eastern Fujian. So now we'll go into the Northern Fujian ceramics. Um, these were the, these, we had the least amount of northern Fujian ceramics. This ewer is from the National Museum of the Philippines. Uh, you can find it on display. It was found in a shipwreck in the southwest coast of Palawan. It's from the northern, it's from the sort of southern, it's from the southern Song Dynasty. So it's a very beautiful piece. So when you go to the National Museum, uh, you'll find this on display there. So this was our display for our northern Fujian. Uh, we just had one display cabinet, and those were all the pieces that we had. So among the pieces that we had on display um, was this uh, northern Fujian greenware. So if you remember going to my map, Northern Fujian is near the border of Zhejiang. And Zhejiang was very well known for making celadons. So, um, so this kiln, which is called Songsi, uh, was probably trying to mimic or imitate celadons that were being made in Zhejiang province. Um, it's a very nice uh, specimen. Uh, it has a very nice grace. So this piece is uh, from the Southern Song Bank. This is also from the Southern Song Dynasty, and it's an octagonal um, covered box with a floral design. It has traces of green and gold on it. So if you look closely to your screen, the petals have uh, hints of uh, gold lines on it. So you'll see that inside and outside of the box. This piece belongs to the Roberto Villanueva collection found at the Ayala Museum. One of the best known kilns in northern Fujian is the Jan kiln or the Jan Yao. Um, these bowls were very popular internally for the imperial court and they're also very popular for the Japanese market. Um, these were exported to Japan, and they're also known as the temuku uh, because of they were um, they were attractive to the Japanese because of the dark color and beautiful grays. So um, it was something that they liked in their drink and uh, their tea drinking ceremony. So this one is from the Southern Song period. Okay, so I've introduced you to the different ceramics from the different Fujian. Uh, locations, uh, regions. And now, where in the Philippines do you find Fujian where? This is a partial list of Fujian ceramics found in the Philippines. This is based on publications and documents um, by different scholars. 
Um, you have uh, the central bank saying that some were found in Laguna, some were found in shipwrecks. We also have some um, documentation from, um, from the National Museum that they found in Palawan. We also have some excavations that were done in Laguna in different places. Um, on the right, you see a location map uh, which was done in the, which was documented by Cecilia Luxin in the 60s, 70s. And there she put locations of uh, pieces that were found from the Tang to the Ming Dynasty. So as you can see, um, you, find, you can find uh, trade ceramics all over the Philippines. And as I mentioned earlier, um, by the time the Yuan Dynasty came in, they had already reached the whole Philippines because they were so aggressive in increasing trade. So here's a close-up of that map. Okay, oops, sorry. Okay, so this is a representation of a burial ritual done in Pila Laguna. They found uh, different wares, especially Fujian ware in Pila Laguna, and it was part of the um, ritual when burying with it. In fact, a lot of pieces uh, come from shipwrecks or from uh, grave sites. And very few come from maybe urban pieces. So, so I wanted you to have an uh, idea um, what the color of uh, color palette of carmine is and what it looks like. And the reason for that is because where did Filipinos trade for these ceramics? Well, um, we know that they traded gold. Um, it was documented again. Uh, I think it was also the Central Bank where they documented that we were making gold jewelry 1,000 to 1,500 years ago. And again, uh, you can just go to the Ayala Museum to look at the, the, the gold um, exhibition, beautiful exhibition. You can see uh, the workmanship of the pre-colonial uh, Filipino jewelers. And, they, and of course, you see the belts, the very thick uh, gold belts that were made. So we traded gold, we traded pearls, and we also traded dye. And um, I don't really hear much emphasis of dye um, when we talk about trade. What did the Filipinos trade during that time? And uh, apparently, um, we have um, very good wood uh, that made dye that was very much sought after by the Chinese and the Japanese for dyeing their silk. So we would send the wood to China, to Japan, and other places. And uh, some of these wood uh, would create that carmine color that I showed you earlier. So some of our mountains had an abundance of this. Um, I was thinking also in Cebu, um, if I understand correctly, there's a, we have balayo in Cebu, which is also a good dye. So by the time the Spaniards came to the Philippines, we were already uh, trading dye. And they saw that trading dye was very profitable. And if I'm not mistaken, uh, there was a 40 to 60% margin in trading dye with our Asian neighbors. So when the Spaniards came and they colonized us, they took over that business from the Filipinos. Um, also, some of the dye came from places like Pampanga, Laguna, and Cebu. Um, traders that were living in Manila uh, were, were getting their uh, dye from Laguna. So I'm wondering, maybe, is that one of the reasons why we find a lot of uh, trade ceramics in these places? 
So I'm almost finished. I'm almost finished. Um, in this catalog and exhibition, we presented the longtime research and collaboration of Ms. Rita Tan, uh, who's from the Philippines, and she has been studying these ceramics, as I said, for many years. And with Li Jian An, the leading Chinese archaeologist, we were able to identify the provenance of these pieces. And with this, we want to uh, let the public know uh, when they see these pieces, what they are, because they are the most abundant variety of Chinese trade ceramics in the Philippines. So, um, in an article uh, done by the Yala Museum, Rita, in retrospect, said that uh, there were many copious examples uh, from a number of kilns in Fujian. Uh, that were copying pieces or designs from other kilns. And I think earlier I, I told you that, for example, with the, with the, the Northern Fujian, they were copying uh, the Zhejiang Celadons. Even the Southern Fujian were trying to uh, copy the Celadons. So the Eastern Fujian was trying to copy some of the um, Defla ware. So there was a lot of uh, copious examples going on there. So Cebuanos can easily find Fujian ceramics at the Rosita Art Arsenas collection of Chinese and Southeast Asian tradeware at the University of San Carlos Museum. So you don't have to look hard because you have it there. And for those in Manila, you can go to the Ayala Museum, to the Roberto Villanueva Collection, or you can go to Bahai Chinoy, which is located in Intramuros, or you can go to the National Museum of the Philippines. And uh, some extra trivia for the Cebuanos, at the Rosita R. Arsenas Collection, you can find one of the largest pieces of Fujian ware that uh, we found during our research. And this is a huge jar with a wide mouth and has an, ins has an incised design of, of a fish and waves. It's from the Southern Song. Um, and it's about 89 centimeters in height. And if I'm not mistaken, this was found washed up in a beach uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's Bantayan Island. So I hope that this talk um, you know, has given you a newfound knowledge and that when you see Fujian ceramics at a museum or at someone's house, that you can now appreciate it's 700 years or 1,000 years, the, the story that it tells us of how we traded uh, with our neighbors, especially with uh, those that came from Fujian province. So some points to consider. Um, we have a lot of pieces in our catalog that of course I did not have enough time to show you. In case uh, you would like to learn more, I encourage you to um, get one of our books on Fujian ware. And um, you'll also get to read the stories of some of the shipwrecks that have this Fujian ware that were found in Palawan. I believe we talked about two shipwrecks. And also shipwrecks are also discussed by um, Mr. Lee Jan An in his, um, in his article. Okay. So what I also like about it, because I also uh, work in some companies, it's nice to compare business, the business practices of then and now. And it seems that it's almost the same, wherein, um, you know, uh, there's manufacturing and production of a volume number of pieces, but if it's high end, like in Jungla, there's not that many pieces, but they're very good pieces. And then in Southern Fujian, they have 
so many pieces, but you notice the glaze doesn't go all the way to the bottom or is hurriedly done. And, and so it's, it's interesting to see that. And right now we're still doing trade with our Southeast Asian neighbors, but we're no longer trading ceramics, gold, pearls, and dye. We're just trading bananas and um, computers and other things. So it, it's interesting to see it in, in that view. So um, please contact us. Um, OCSP is a nonprofit organization. So your purchase of our book will help us with our next project, which is Celadon's Bound in the Philippines. So Daghang Salamat, Maraming Salamat. Thank you very much. Uh, so thank you again to everybody for listening. I hope you're still awake. And uh, I think now we can move on to the next portion, which I believe is the question and answer portion and the trivia portion. Yes, uh, thank you very thank much, you very much. Uh, Ms. Deliza Redeloso Mamdel for that. Uh, I feel it's a visual feast that I've seen of all the ceramics from uh, the 11th or 14th century that we have here, uh, traded here in the Philippines. And uh, thank you for the comprehensive uh, walkthrough or knowledge that we we gained actually this afternoon about the different ceramics that are that were found here in the Philippines. Um, just uh, quickly, we will have a a few questions, uh, Mamdel. I hope uh, you're willing to answer them. The first question: Can we flash? Okay, this one comes from Aimi C. Tabada. When these ceramics were excavated, were there traces of their contents or just grime and dirt? Well, if you look at some of the documents, uh, for example, from Cecilia Loxen, I mean, I really loved how she documented all of this. Um, she found other things in the grave sites, and these were documented, so they weren't just ceramics. So sometimes there was jewelry, sometimes there was something else. Yes, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Miss Aimi Tabada, for your question. This is a sort of like a follow up from me this time, uh, Mamdel. Um, what, what were, why did the pre colonial sub, um, Filipinos, why did they like trading the, the, their gold, their dye, uh, their pearls for the, the ceramics? What, what use did they have for them? Well, one is we didn't have the technology to create similar pieces. If you notice, uh, the hot, maybe for the Philippines, we only had the highest that we went was uh, ribbonware. So these were, some of these pieces were high fired um, and uh, they were beautiful pieces. And some of them were utilitary pieces, uh, which we couldn't make ourselves. So. I guess for some of our early Filipinos, they felt that it was a good trade uh, to get these uh, different uh, ceramics that were some of, that were high fire that were not just the uh, earthenware that easily broke and that were also beautiful to look at because of the glaze. So, yeah. Probably they really did find it very beautiful, Mandel, and very precious because they brought, the, brought them with them when they were buried. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, to the grave. Yeah. Um, I to remember they are also utilitarian. Like yeah, uh, right. there are some there are some theories that, uh, for example, the candies uh, were used um, for the Hindus that were still living in the Philippines because we also have uh, traces of uh, Hinduism uh, before I think, um, before the Muslims. And so there were still some practices maybe of putting the oil inside the candies. So it's also cultural. Yeah. Religious, but also the religious, uh, for religious reasons. All right. Uh, do we have another question? Can we flash the next one? From Always Bologna says, Hi, Ms. Deliza. I enjoyed your lecture. I'd like to find out if there's any literature that you encountered regarding the dye that the Philippines traded to get all these ceramics. Thanks. Yes, this literature came from the Intramuros administration. They made a publication 
on uh, uh, indigenous Filipino wood and, in, and that these indigenous Filipino wood was used not only for dye, but also for um, like herbal, herbal remedies. Yeah. Thank you, uh, always, Bologna, for your question. Uh, Ma'am Del, I have noticed also that uh, from you, you gave us a quick run through of the different pieces that came from uh, the southern Yuan province from the central to the northern, uh, sorry, Song no? uh, dynasty. And I noticed that there were differences, although they're a land landlocked uh, place. And uh, why is this so, Ma'am? Like, um, I've noticed that. Uh, the white wares come from the central and the the, mm. the northern um, Fujian province gave sort of like a, a sort of brownish tint to their or a brownish color um, to the material. Well, you'll, you'll find a brown glazed uh, pieces in southern Fujian. You'll also find brown glazed uh, ceramics in central Fujian. So uh, what you don't really find in the other places that you'll find in northern Fujian is the black glaze that you find in January or January. Oh, okay. Uh, but is is it true because it's based on the examples? I I don't really know about the the entire extent, ma'am. No, but I uh, I have noticed also that uh, the Yuan province actually created more, uh, put in more etchings, must be more definitely. So yes, Yuan, yes. Yeah, so the Yuan Dynasty used uh, uh, more of the threaded design. We call it a threaded pattern. Threaded pattern, okay. A thread pattern. Sometimes they, it's a threaded pattern of, um, of leaves or a phoenix. Yeah, so it's really quite different. Um, there but was you also, a see it, you also see it in some of the late song uh, uh, candies. You also see. Uh, some of those uh, threaded patterns. Uh, so that pattern probably came at the later part of the production, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, um, there's a, uh, there was a question from my colleague, or there's another question, by the way, and we'd like to flash it. Uh, mm -hmm. From IAT Philippines, good afternoon, ma'am. Can you also determine the age of the collected ceramics? If so, what are the ways of determining its age? Is it through carbon dating, argon dating, or another kind? Mm -hmm. So, well, unfortunately for us, it's very expensive for our museums and for us to do carbon dating. It's really costly. So one of the things that we use is reference to coins. So, for example, in the gravesite, if there's a coin uh, that gives us an idea of the time period, also, uh, if we have other ceramics from other provinces that were very popular and we knew they, that they were from that period, then we can hypothesize that they were also from there. Like earlier, I showed you that Eastern Fujian Jarlet uh, that was from the Yuan Dynasty. We were able to find it on a Chinese junk uh, in Palawan which was also with a blue and white Yuan uh, uh, piece from Jing De Jen. So, um, so then that that uh, you know gave some kind of confirmation that this really this piece is really from the Yuan Dynasty. Although there's that chance it can come from the south, late Southern Song, but uh, excavations also from uh, from the Chinese archaeologists also help us confirm the period. So. What's changed in the last 10 years? In the last 10 years, we're getting more information from the archaeologists abroad, uh, whether from uh, China or Thailand and, um, and some other uh, Southeast Asian neighbors. Uh, we're getting more information. Uh, they're doing more excavations, and they're able to help us determine the period of where these, when these ceramics uh, were produced. Thank you, ma'am. And thank you, IAT Philippines, for that question. Let's have our second to the last or our last question. Mm -hmm. Well, I would just like to go back to the question of Miss Olis Bologna regarding uh, which publication. I just want uh, also to thank uh, the library of Professor uh, Juan T. Lim 
Uh, he has a, a library that uh, I was in, he his family graciously let me um, review uh, the books, and I was able to find that publication. So uh, maybe I can ask the family if they have an extra copy. Maybe they can donate a copy to the National Museum. Right, that's great, ma'am. Okay, uh, the next question, please. From Micah Fisher. Hi, thanks for the very informational talk. May I know what was the hardest part you encountered in your research and documentation? Cleaning the pieces with a cotton bud, especially the very large pieces. And yeah. uh, there were three of us who were cleaning that. I think because maybe we were the youngest in the group, I don't know, but uh, Angel Bautista, Ten Ten Nina, and I were on the table with these cotton buds and distilled water cleaning each piece. I wow. think that was the most difficult part. <laughs> that required a lot of patience, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, a lot of patience. <laughs> um, ma'am, uh, the 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 ceramics that you found were they whole or because we we saw in the pictures they were whole. Were mm -hmm. they all whole? Um, where were they found? Why were they whole? Most of uh, what I know, they're, they're in shards. Um, well, the pictures that you saw that were mostly in shards were from excavations uh, um, or the wasters that you see in China or, in, or the Fujian museums that they went to. So the pieces that we have in the Philippines are mostly whole uh, because of... Uh, they were uh, kept uh, whole. Uh, some of them were kept whole uh, because uh, they were in shipwrecks and the sea was able to protect uh, a lot of these plates oh, cool. and uh, pieces. And also there were some uh, grave sites also where uh, these pieces were also whole. And, uh, and also some heirlooms that maybe were passed on. But in terms of the food done pieces, most of them came from uh, shipwrecks and grave sites. It's interesting that the sea protected them and it did not affect the, the wares, ma'am. Yeah, well, of course, there were some that were broken, but most of them, uh, uh, because some of these pieces uh, were put in big jars, actually. So that big jar um, in the Arsenas collection, um, Mr. Lee, I think he was explaining to me that uh, they put the smaller... Uh, jars, or I mean the smaller, like the plates and the bowls in there also. Yeah, right. Anyway, well, we, we had, this was a very interesting afternoon. Um, I, I didn't know that ceramics could be very interesting. <laughs> and uh, as uh, mentioned by Mom Dale, they're very also difficult to clean and, and it requires a lot of patience. I'm pretty sure, Mom, and uh, I'd like to congratulate also the um, Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines for doing this uh, tireless work. I, I mean, and then preserving and document and documenting the pieces and uh, for finding ways for for them to be exhibited. I hope at some point they come to Cebu also <laughs> and uh, exhibit some things here. We're happy to find out also from Rafi from the Ramon Aboitis Foundation that uh, some of our Aboitis is, um members are actually part of the society. And with that, Mom Dell, we'd like to present to you, and we'll send this through career, but we'd like to present to you the GSK um, Certificate of Appreciation given to Ms. Deliza Reduloso for sharing her expertise and time as resource speaker of the webinar Fujian Ceramics Traded in the Pre-Colonial Philippines during this Gabi Isa Kabin 2020 online activity for September. Given this 26th, Day of September 2020 at Casa Gordo Museum, Eduardo Aboite Street, Cebu City, signed by our president in Rafi uh, and CEO as well, Miss Dominica B. Chua. Thank you very much, Mom Dale, for taking the time for sharing uh, your expertise about Fujian ceramics. Thank you, Mom. Uh, you're very much welcome, but I'd also like to uh, emphasize it's not just my, my uh, expertise, but this is... Uh, uh, this project was because of the members of the Oriental Ceramic Society. And uh, like I said earlier, it was it took a village to complete this project. And it's the expertise uh, of all of us uh, in the society together. I'm just a representative uh, helping uh, 
uh, spread the information. Yeah, thank you for that, Ms. Mamdel. And we'd like to thank, of course, the Oriental Ceramic Society of the Philippines, as well as your team, Mamdel, Sir Teddy, and Ms. Tina. Thank you very much for coordinating with us. Thank you, and Thank you, ma'am. And we'd also like to thank Sir Joe Burris for passing on this webinar to GSK. Thank you to the USC Museum and Museo Parian Sa Subo 17th Jesuit House for hosting. And we'd also like to thank our, the, our other partner museums and sites for the Gabi Isa Kabilin. Appreciation also goes to the GSK Organizing Committee for ensuring that this webinar runs smoothly to Joey, Arlene, Mardel, Sig, and uh, Mac. Also to Faye and our uh, business development group uh, for helping us promote this online activity. For uh, those who are wondering whether we have trivia, we have trivia because this uh, webinar is going to be posted uh, in our GSK site. will remain there for everyone, for those who are were not able to join us this afternoon. And uh, a few days after, we will be giving out the trivia so that uh, more can join our trivia. So watch out for that. For those who have registered and would like to get an e-certificate, um, all you need to do is also fill out the evaluation form that comes right after this uh, webinar and we'll stay on until I think tomorrow half day. So uh, during lunch, lunch time, we'll take it out. But uh, that's only for those who want to get hold of an e-certificate. We'd also like to invite everyone to our GSK online activities for October. We have in October 2, that's already this Friday. It's in partnership with the 500 years of Christianity of the Archdiocese of Cebu. Um, they, they will be, uh, rather they, will, they are partnering with us to host the uh, keynote address of the opening of their social media activities, and this would be by Dr. Danilo Herona, one of our foremost uh, um, acad academics here in the Philippines on uh, Spanish colonization. Um, it will be about the impact of uh, Christianity in Filipino life and culture. I think that would be very interesting. On October 9, we'll be showing to you as promised, this was postponed uh, last week, but now we're going to be showing this in October 9, uh, the feature on the Fort San Pedro. And on October 23, uh, this will be hosted by the STC uh, Museum, Folklife Museum. They will be giving us an online storytelling of Visayan myths and legends. So I hope you will join us uh, for the next month in all our GSK online activities. And with that, we'd like to thank you for spending your afternoon with us. I know the there was the, the problem with our internet connections, but don't worry because you will be able to see the video, the webinar uh, as a whole in the Gabi Isa Kabilin FB page. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Goodbye. Again, thank you so much for your valuable time and for participating in our fourth webinar. We hope to see you again next month for another engaging activity to appreciate and experience Cebu's culture and heritage. Only here at the Bibi Sakabilin 2020 Online Activities. Have a good day.